Hello, hello! Welcome to the stream, everyone. I am aware of the really low bitrate. I don't know what's going on. I... Man, I, it's just like every third or fourth week I get this terrible uh, uh, bitrate uh, streaming. I cannot wait until the fiber comes to my house. They dug a big like six foot hole in my front yard to put the fiber wires there. And sometime they said at the beginning of this year, they're actually going to be able to connect them to my house so I can get the fiber internet. I paid them $30 so I'd be on the list to get connected right away. But, oh my God. Anyway, <laughs> thanks everyone for coming. I am recording uh, this as well, not just streaming it. So then after the fact, I can go back and upload a nice video with a nice frame rate and not this choppy craziness that I'm sure you're, you're all watching right now. Anyway, hey BimDav, hey Ricardo, hey Slacks, hey Sergio. Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, you guys got some sweet characters. Bimdav is like a an old wise orc with a white beard. I'm uh, really decked out here. I got some some armor, shield, a kind of like conquistador hat going. Ricardo's just you know a normal normal looking person. <laughs> Slacks, you're you're some kind of afroed orc monk, uh, which seems pretty awesome. Sergio's got a sweet helmet. Hey, Code with Tom, welcome to the stream. It's been a while since I chatted with you. Uh, geez, when would that have been? Like the beginning of 2021 when we were working on that uh, uh, Heroic Labs project? Welcome to the stream. You got also a conquistador hat and a sweet beard with some, you know, uh, uh, what are those? Shoulder plates, armor things. And who else just joined? I saw someone else hopped in here. Uh, RWWKV6. Let me see what people are actually saying. Um, Code with Tom says, Hey, RWWKV6 says, Morning. Yeah, mid 2021, last time we chatted. So, like I mentioned earlier, there's more people now. I'll say it again. I know that the bitrate is bad, my internet is terrible. I don't know. I'm recording this also. I'll upload the, the recording to YouTube afterwards. So that uh, after the fact, you can actually see what I was doing. <laughs> also, um, I'm sorry to say I love our overlay. Uh, by the way, this is the overlay is a game may we, we made in Godot on stream a bunch of months ago. I'm going to have to kill it. I'm going to have to end it. If you guys remember from stream number 34, there is some conflict between Godot, and this is a Godot app, and uh, the tool that I use to cast my phone to my screen. And we are working on uh, WebXR, fixing a bug that affects smartphone AR today. So I have to kill the overlay. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. We have all these sweet characters, but I'm going to kill it. Bam, it's gone. OK. Um, <laughs> what else do I have on my list? I, I guess I forgot to ask how everybody's doing. How are your projects going? Uh, for me, this has been a really chaotic week since last stream. Uh, I released uh, the Alpha 1 version of the rollback netcode add-on for Godot, and people are already using it. I re it was five days ago I released it. Um, so that's cool. I've been recording the uh, first tutorial video for the tutorial series about how to use uh, the rollback netcode add-on in your game. Uh, that hasn't stopped people, which is super cool. Uh, there's, you know, just this readme, and uh, people have been making do. Um, and yeah, I added the rest of Ross's art to Retro Tank Party, which is super cool. I'll show you guys that really quick, um, because I can. Oh, I went to the wrong page. So where am I trying to go to? I'm trying to go to, not D Snowpack, Snowpack Games. Ross, uh, who, I don't know if he's going to come to the stream today, but is frequently on the stream, um, made a bunch of extra art packs for Retro Tank Party. And uh, this is the classic look of Retro Tank Party. So, you know, uh, this sort of deal, the Kenny art that we've had since forever, the SNES one that I was showing uh, on last stream, but he also made a vector one, which I, I really like this. I really like this. I think we need to add... Um, like a, a bloom effect if I actually find the time to do it. I don't know where I'm going to find the time. I have too many things going right now. But like a sweet bloom effect I think would look really cool on this. And then this Atari 2600 
uh, art style, which is super minimal. It doesn't really look like the Atari 2600. The graphical fidelity here is way better than the Atari could ever have managed. Um, but it's still cool. It's cool to have all these different um, looks. And it's called Retro Tank Party. It, the art isn't actually particularly retro in the default art pack. So I'm, I'm super... Uh, Super excited about that. Anyway, we're not going to be doing anything with Retro Tank Party today on stream. We're also not going to be doing anything with uh, the rollback uh, code or any of that. Um, today, we are taking a little detour to work on some WebXR stuff. Uh, before I do that, though, I want to see how everybody else is saying they're doing. How are you and yours, Snope? I'm doing all right. Slacks, things have been going slowly, feeling rough all week. Ooh, I hope you don't have the Omicron. I mean, despite it sounding awesome, Omicron is, is just a sweet word. It makes me think of Transformers. There's a Transformer with Omicron in the name. I can't remember which one. But man, I hope you feel better. The Clean. Hello, everyone. Hello, The Clean. Sergio, is that GLES2? I think Bloom would be hard. Yeah, it is GLES2. Um, it is possible to do Bloom in GLES2, but not by using the like built-in Godot shader stuff that could do Bloom, because uh, the color space is is not suitable. But there is a way to do it. Um, and I don't know, I don't know. If I find the time, I'll do it. Or maybe I'll have a thing where like, you switch that art style and ask you, do you want to turn on the bloom? And then it'll like force to restart the game to switch to GLES3, I don't know, I don't know. Wishful thinking, I, I really need honestly for like my own personal sanity to stop working on Retro Tank Party sometime soon. It has consumed my whole life since uh, uh, the beginning of 2021 and uh, I need to move on to some other stuff. And and this this stream doing WebXR things is kind of part of that. I want to start actually making some VR games, uh, but you know, taking this time to, to at least do something connected with AR and VR is, is good for me. Oh, sweet slacks, take that test, take care of yourself. BIMDAV, I'm finally starting to get new online multiplayer project. Uh, with absolute perfect timing to use your work. Sweet! I know it's not the subject today, but could you ex please explain on stream why you decided to roll your own physics engine instead of, I really have no idea if it's possible, fixing Godot physics. <laughs> I know that some of your time were thinking of quantizing floats, for example. Yeah, um, I didn't want to create my own physics engine. Uh, the Physics is cool, but it's not like... It's not primarily my thing. I'm not so good at the math. <laughs> and having like written a whole custom physics engine kind of kind of stressed me out a bit. Um, I'm really hoping that uh, once it picks up a little bit of steam, I'll be able to find a collaborator who is much more into physics and much more into the math who can who can help <laughs> take care of some of that work. Um, but no, it it just kind of turned out to be necessary. There really isn't a way to fix the Godot physics engine to make it deterministic. Um, to have true like deterministic movement and collision detection through the world you need to have no floats all the way down and while it is possible in Godot 4 to like have separate physics engines that you can sort of like swap in and you'll still use the same nodes you'll still use kinematic body 2d and all of that stuff but you just switch what physics engine it is on the back end it still floats all the way down the stack um, and there's no way around that uh, so to truly make truly deterministic movement and deterministic collision detection, you have to make it be integer math throughout or soft floats throughout. Hardware floats will lead you to a world of non-determinism. So uh, I, I had to do it. I didn't really want to, um, but it's there. <laughs> it's a new tool in the toolbox for people doing Godot stuff. So um, lately, a whole bunch of people uh, have been finding bugs in the physics engine, which I kind of wish you guys had found those bugs like two months ago before I had unloaded all of the physics stuff out of my brain, but it's fine, it's fine. Thank you for, <laughs> for reporting the bugs and sending me reproduction projects. Possibly next week uh, stream, I don't know, I don't know what, what we'll be doing, but it might be a good topic for that stream, going through the, the bugs and, and fixing them. Um, that might be interesting. Let me know let, what you guys think about that. But yeah, so impure rollback transmitting not only inputs, but also position, et cetera. Yeah, that's a possibility. That's a possibility. You can do um, something where you're syncing not just inputs, but state. But so, okay. If you're syncing inputs, you're, you're sort of gearing everything to work one particular way. If you're syncing state, you now have to have like a way to reconcile the state too. You know what I mean? Like uh, there's, there's, um, network synchronization techniques based solely on state, and they have to have all these different pieces in there to uh, deal with reconciling that. And now you have to do both things, right? That's 
that's that's a bunch of work too. So I don't know. I um uh I'm I'm happy with the way it ended up going, but certainly like uh maybe in a future project I might try something like that, doing uh both inputs and state and uh I'd love to hear how other people do uh, trying that sort of approach as well. Um, that'd be really cool to, to have that to have that extra experience added to the community. <laughs> Ricardo likes seeing physics bugs on stream. They are fun. Physics bugs are fun. <laughs> so um, let's let's talk about what we're actually working on this stream. Um, so if you remember back in stream thirty four. Sergio, who is on the stream this time, thanks for coming, Sergio, reported a bug uh, that had to do with smartphone AR. Um, if you tried to put uh, any UI over the scene, uh, like some buttons or whatever, uh, when you went into AR mode, the buttons wouldn't be there and everything would become semi-transparent. That was the original bug, right? Um, we managed to fix part of that on stream. Um, I guess, yeah, let me, let me kill Godot here. I will load up, uh, my little demo on my phone and you can see the, the current state of things. Uh, let me remember all the steps I have to go through to do that. Okay. Turn on the phone. All right. <laughs> Step one, start this app screen copy. It took us a while to get used to this workflow last time too. Um, Server connection failed. All right. Unplug it. Plug it back in. Take two. Hey, it's there, but it's on the wrong screen. Let me switch it over so you guys can see it. Rotate it sideways here. All right. We are almost looking at my phone. There we go. Okay. <laughs> um, let me make sure I have... This running here, oh, it's on a different IP this time. Oh, right, because I'm not on the Wi-Fi. Every time I start a stream, I disable my Wi-Fi to just use the wired connection because I think it helps avoid exactly the problem we're having today with the, um, the bit rate being so low. But that might just be, um, I don't know, voodoo, not, not voodoo, like what's the, like superstition. It might just be superstition that I think it helps, but it doesn't actually. Come on. Perhaps I need to restart this and start it again. Ah, stupid loose cable. Okay, I'm going to kill this, start it again, see what happens here. Oh, my phone's not on the Wi-Fi. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Comedy of errors. Okay, here we go. Advanced, proceed. All right, so this is my Toy Racer XR demo. It doesn't really do anything in AR, uh, but it will like load into AR mode. And I've just been using this to test this bug. Here we go. So this button up in the left, this is the button we're using to test. I press it, it says pressed. Um, that's before we've entered uh, WebXR, before we've entered immersive AR mode. So I enter AR. You now see uh, that sort of like race car track superimposed over my real world environment here. And you can still see the button in the upper left. So before stream 34, the button wouldn't even appear. But when you try to press the button, I'm tapping it with my finger here, nothing happens, right? Um, and there's still the, the semi-translucent thing. So we fixed one problem on stream 34. The button is now rendering, but we have two more problems. Uh, the no input works and the uh, uh, it's still rendering transparent there. So since that stream, I had a chat on Discord with D Panther, uh, who maintains the Unity WebXR integration. And he explained to me how touch events are supposed to work in AR. And it's crazy. So I, if you guys remember from that stream, I theorized that perhaps once you enter AR mode, you can't get touch events the normal way. So we were right about that. You can't get touch events the normal way. But the way that you get them is just weird. It's really weird. Um, so let me attempt to explain this. Um, I don't know if I really need to draw something, but I like drawing things. I'm terrible at it, but I like doing it. 
Uh, create. Okay, so um, in uh, WebXR, there are, what do they call them, input sources. Uh, the most common input sources when you're doing VR are like your controllers. How close am I to a headset right now? I could grab a controller. I'm nowhere near a headset. Ooh, I got bringed. Who bringed me? So here's a, a Quest 2 controller. Um, but it also accepts like a whole bunch of other input devices for different things. You might be dealing with uh, Google Cardboard where you don't have any kind of input device. You can just press like the volume up and down buttons and those count as like the inputs. Or you could have smartphone AR where we're tapping or whatever. Um, and the, the different input sources can have game pads associated with them. So here's how this works. <laughs> um, come on, why does this always act weird when I first start using it? So here's the screen, a really bad square. If you tap the screen somewhere, it counts that as a select event uh, in WebXR. In WebXR, you have select and uh, squeeze events, which on a controller, select would be pressing this and squeeze would be this. Um, but you get a, a select and squeeze event on a special kind of input source, which has a gamepad attached to it. And it's imagining that the X and Y position is a position on the gamepad's joystick. So it will give you a position from negative one to one on two axes of this virtual non-existent joystick. And you have to convert those into screen positions and then generate touch events from them. Who came up with this? This is crazy. And the, the crazier thing, perhaps, is that I can't find any documentation for this anywhere. Um, D Panther said he got it. Uh, he learned about this by talking to the Chrome team. Um, but like, I looked through every uh, spec that I thought would be related to this and couldn't find it documented anywhere. And maybe I just didn't find it. Maybe it's really there. Um, but I don't know. So this is how this is supposed to work. And here's what I'm thinking. Um, we should be able to implement a version of this directly in GDScript um, because we can get the select event. We can access the joy axes. At least I think so. I haven't actually tried it. And uh, get this information, convert it to pixels. I think we can even generate the faux touch events and just send them into Godot's like input processing system. And that should make the button work. And then once we have that working in GDScript, we can go to C++ and JavaScript and actually code it into uh, Godot's WebXR support. So it just like works out of the box for anyone doing WebXR stuff and make a PR. And then everyone's happy. And we will solve another part of Sergio's bug. <laughs> So what's going on in what's going on in chat here? Milk and banana. Hey yo, welcome to the stream, milk and banana. Uh, Bimdav says I just finished a project mainly working on physics for months. <laughs> I really liked it, so I would love to contribute to SG Physics. Ooh, Bimdav, you may be my hero. <laughs> I'm thumbs upping this in uh, in Discord here. That would be sweet. Working on netcode stuff, I love it, and I'm good at it, and I've done it forever. Physics? Eh. <laughs> I could take it or leave it. Sergio says placebo should be the word. I'm not sure what you're referring to, Sergio. I must have uh, uh, been uh, been talking for a while and missed what that comment's in, in relation to. <laughs> Ric uh, Ricardo says, sounds like a plan. Sergio is super excited. And Milk and Banana thinks something looks sick. Awesome. I don't know what that was, but I agree. Whatever it was was totally sick. OK, <laughs> so let's get started, folks. Um, we can kill this thing because it will conflict with Godot. We'll launch the Godot editor here. Go to our toy racer project and jump into the code. So I started this a little bit last night, mostly just because I wanted to load uh, WebXR back into my brain. I can't keep so many things in my brain. So uh, every time I stop working on WebXR, I unload all of the information and then I have to like reload it. Um, but all I really did was I added this uh, on WebXR select uh, handler for the WebXR select signal. And it just like prints out something when a controller, uh, when, when a select event happens and gives us the controller ID. And then we're going to use this ID to get the joystick axes. 
Um, so yeah, should we look at that real quick? Let's look at that real quick. It also help me get Chrome going here because we need to use Chrome to uh, debug things. Oh, geez, what password? So if you have never done a web dev on mobile devices, there is this really cool feature of Chrome that lets you remote debug uh, the Chrome browser on a mobile device. It works with your phone, also the Quest, if you're doing WebXR apps uh, for the Quest. Do I have to re reload it? Reload. And I will just show you that this works. I won't try to get the screen sharing all going at the same time too. Oh, it might actually show it here though. That'd be pretty cool. Then I don't even have to do the screen sharing thing. Okay, so I, I uh, enter AR. And I guess it won't show anything uh, over here for some reason when we're actually using the app. Oh no, it was disconnected. Reconnect, reconnect. It's my loose connector, I bet. Did it reconnect? It did not. Oh, jeez. Just for the stream. Could you just work just for the stream, Chrome? Okay, here we go. And so I'll tap. There we go. We're getting select three. And the reason the controller... I, whoa, how did I get zero? I was about to explain why it's controller ID three, and then suddenly I got a controller ID zero. What? Um, what am I doing to get that? Let me try touching volume. Hmm. Yeah, I just got a zero again. How do I keep getting the zero? That might be a bug somewhere. So, um, controller ID three, I, I think the way this is supposed to work, I'll, I'll double check in the code, um, is that it's supposed to be like controller ID one and two are always the left and right controller. And then any uh, controllers that are not like, you know, touch controller type controllers will be any numbers three and above. So that's why it's three. Um, let's go look at the code here real quick. How are we getting that zero? Um, so this is the JavaScript code that's kind of behind the C++ code that makes WebXR work. And what we are looking for is... Ooh, okay, here, we're going to be calling this method later. This doesn't relate to what I'm trying to show you right now, but um, I think this is where we're going to be getting the, the joystick axes. Where the heck does it send the actual controller events? Or wait, no, no, it just samples them from JavaScript, and then it does it in C++. Let's go to the C++ code. Scrolling through the code. Update tracker. This sounds like it could be it. Okay, so... How are we getting the select events? Let's just, let's just look for the word select in here. Select. We'll start at the top. There is no word select. That doesn't make sense. <laughs> okay, I think I think the C++ code is just doing this generic on input event thing. Let's go back to the JavaScript code. Where is this on select? Select. Here we go, select start. So we add an event listener. We call input event get controller ID. So get controller ID. This is the one we want. Get controller ID. So get controller ID just gets its index within the list of input sources. And here we go. Sample controllers is what is assigning these, these controller IDs. Whew, took a while to get there. So you can see if it's a tracked pointer, that's like a, a traditional uh, you know, XR touch controller. Um, it will assign the right always to ID one, left will always be ID zero actually. So zero should be like the left controller. That is so weird. And uh, everything else gets uh, some number above that. 
So why are we getting, if it starts at zero, why are we getting three and not two? That is also interesting. Hmm. A mystery. Well, there's a lot of things going on in AR. I don't have a lot of experience with AR, so we'll we'll be we'll be messing around with it, and maybe the the mystery will become clearer as we go. Let me quick take a look at at uh, what's going on in chat. Have you tried increasing the buffer size in your streaming software? That's an interesting an interesting idea. Uh, I don't want to get too derailed and like start working on the stream itself. Um, so I am using. OBS, where do I configure the buffer size in OBS? So on output, I get to set the, the bit rate, I get to set the encoder, I get to set the audio bit rate. I have 64 gigs of RAM. The buffer could be big. I, if there's a, like a, a thing, I could just be like, make the buffer be like, six gigs like that should work i i have lots of ram um i just don't know where the setting is if someone knows uh let me know like send me a link to the to the obs docs or something because i i would love to have some solution to this wacky bitrate problem um anyway milka badana says the ar thing looked great sweet <laughs> thanks josmar pinhero like <laughs> Welcome, Josmar. Sergio says, maybe gesture, drag and pinch. Yeah, I'm not sure. It didn't feel like I was, it just felt like I was tapping. I don't know. Well, hopefully the mystery will reveal itself. We shall see. All right. So first things first, let's go to our project in Godot. We're going to start from the GD script end, like I said, and let's see what info we can get. So we have the controller ID. Uh, there's a way to convert the WebXR controller ID into a um, Godot uh, gamepad ID, uh, which we might need to do, or does the WebXR module give us direct access to that information? Uh, let me check. I should, of course, know the answer to this question because I wrote the WebXR module, but I don't remember. <laughs> who who could remember these things? Um, okay, so... This is the JS. We have some stuff about different supported session types. Get controller. Does the ARVR positional tracker have this information on it or no? No, not really. It has a joy ID. I don't think we, I don't think it's I don't think the positional tracker is the right way to go though. I don't know for sure, but I just feel like that's not the right thing to do. <laughs> yeah, it does not look like we have a way to directly access it. Um, I'm just going to kind of look to see what it what the module is doing with that access information. I'm going to search for the word access. So update tracker. I think this is a thing we call like every um, every frame. And we are grabbing these tracker objects. Oh, so everything should have a tracker. That's interesting. So everything should have a tracker. Um, everything will get a transform. Everything will get an array of buttons. And the axes will actually be set on the joypad axis. And it looks like the, the conversion is plus 100. I was actually going to go to, to look that up. I was going to go read uh, my own article uh, on my blog about how this stuff works. Because again, I, I don't remember. I have to I have to look at my own documentation. Um, yeah, so joypad ID is plus 100. So in GD script to get a joy access, you do something like input get access. Um, nope, that's not what I want. Input get joy access this looks more right controller id plus 100 and i think it's axis zero and one i have um d panthers code so this is this is from d panthers unity webxr export uh repo and here's where he's doing the same thing 
um, he's grabbing yeah axis zero and axis one, and um, converting from uh, you know the the axes range negative one to positive one into a a percentage, which at some point uh, elsewhere he's then converting that into pixels. Um, so let's just print out what's going on on joy axis zero and joy axis one. So this would be axis. Uh, this will be the x-axis, I think, x-axis, and this will be the y-axis. Why are you complaining at me? Ooh, okay, it's just a old, old information. Uh, I'll copy and paste this. What? Copy. Joy axis one, and we'll just print this out, which we'll be able to get uh, through the remote. Chrome debug console. So this will be, uh, we'll say, um, yeah, I'll do it kind of like before. We'll say select the controller ID, and then we'll convert those to X and Y. So controller ID, X axis, Y axis. Delete this one. All right, let's see uh, let's see what happens here. I have to export and then we are going to probably restart this pretty much every time my phone goes to sleep. I usually have to restart debugging in Chrome. Come on. There we go. Oh, you guys get to see what I was reading. <laughs> I should probably close all my tabs before I stream this. <laughs> you can see I was reading this this article about Russell T. Davies' prequel to Doctor Who. You guys don't need to know about my Doctor Who habits. Uh, all right, so we'll reload this. While it's going, I'll see... Oh, nothing going on in chat. All right. All of these errors are harmless. We will enter AR. And we will tap. Ooh, we're not getting anything. We're not getting any access information for uh, this particular event. Hmm, this might be more work than I thought. We might actually have to change some stuff in C++ land. Either we're doing it... Um, either we need to do it differently, or we need to add some new, some new methods for us to, uh, to get this information. So... We are calling this input joy axis. What does this do? We're calling input joy axis. All right, trying to orient myself here. Grabs a joy pad. If the values are the same, it doesn't do anything. Interesting. I'm not entirely sure I understand what this is doing. Working around some some edge case. Some sort of conversion of the value. If it equals negative one, it does this. We're not dealing with negative one. Get mapped access event. If map type button, okay, so this is like uh, um, analog triggers, L2, R2. That doesn't relate to us. We are just doing a normal axis, axis event. It creates an event and sends it. Does that actually update the data that Joy Access would have? Um, that this, this, so we're calling, we're calling, what is the method called? We're calling get joy axis. 
does this actually update whatever data Git Joy Access is looking at? That is the question. Um, so it does some kind of buffering. Or here's where it directly deals with it. Some touch events, some mouse events, emulating mouse from touch, drag events, joypad button, joypad motion. So then this calls set joy axis. Okay, so it does eventually get to setting the joy axis. I'm going to try something else just to make sure that we are like pointed at the right thing. So if we do, I think just input, or is input the one that goes to controls? I always get so confused about some of these methods. Um, let's let's look at the Godot docs for a second. Um, we'll do it in here. So let's look for. Uh, node, I guess it would be node 2D, or just plain node. Input. Called when there is an input event, the input event propagates up through the node tree until a node consumes it. It is only called if input processing is enabled, which is done automatically if this method is overridden. To so consume the input event and stop propagation, call blah. For gameplay input, unhandled input and unhandled key input are usually better. They allowed the GUI to intercept events first. Cool. Uh, we're not thinking about gameplay. I just want to get anything here. We get an input event. Let's uh, let's print it out. I'm not entirely sure what it's going to look like, but um, well, no. We know that we want a joy uh, motion event, right? So if event is input event joypad motion, then print the event. Let's, let's try that. Let's see what that gets us. Export. What is Sergio saying? Is it possible that it's loading the previous cached version? Oh, forget it. I saw that it's the correct print. I didn't notice the 0 comma 0. Yeah, so it's 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 definitely running our code, <laughs> but our code could be wrong, or we might need to do some kind of adjustment to um, the WebXR module to get the information that we need. So let me reload this on my phone. Do, 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 do. Okay, so we are getting a joy event motion. Of course, it's not printing anything useful for us. It's just giving us the, the object name and um, the, uh, the ID of the object. So we'll have to change our debug code a little bit here to print out something that's more useful. I was hoping it would turn it into something cool. I thought there was a thing that input events, maybe we have to call a method? I really did think there was a thing on input events that would print out a nice message. Um, I don't, is this just going to take us to object? Yeah. So I think that's probably what it's already doing. I swear input events had like a nice as text. As text. That's what we need to be calling. Input event as text. All right. Let's give that a try. See what info we can glean here. This is almost as bad as compiling, <laughs> having to uh, go through this th these shenanigans to uh, run it again. We'll have to I'll have to think of some topics for us to talk about while we're during the waiting. Is anybody uh, playing anything cool right now? Lately, I've been playing um, Population One, which is like a VR version of Fortnite, more or less. Um, it's been interesting because. Here we go. 
because it's a smooth motion game and I get VR sickness really bad. <laughs> so I can play it for like 20, 30 minutes and then I spend the rest of the night just like laying on the couch like, ugh. But I, I have so much fun, I'm trying to use it as a way to get over my VR sickness, hopefully. Okay, cool. So we got some really cool uh, looking joypad motion events. It's not telling us what the joypad ID is. So that is the next piece of information. It could be that we just have the ID wrong. Um, so what is that? We'll, we'll print something like ID colon message and event. Uh, what is the joypad ID on here called? It's not going to auto-complete for me. Let's wait for the error to go away. What's the... Oh, I have to put the... the uh, there we go. Now, error, go away. So you can auto-complete for me. So it was like... Is it joy ID? Device? Device? That could be it. Let's jump to the docs for that. Device ID. The ID will always be... Uh, negative one for mouse input for touch screens can be used to distinguish emulated mouse from physical mouse. That might be it. Let's look at input event joypad uh, motion. Has different axes. Okay, that must be it. Device must be it. Let's um. Let's try this. It's still, no, we're disconnected now. Kill this, restart this, reload. <laughs> the clean says, Noida, I hate it. <laughs> so uh, I, I was playing Noida for a while. I don't know if you guys know uh, the Eggplant podcast, formerly known as the, as the Spelunky Show-like podcast. Uh, it's a really great game development uh, podcast. And they do these like into the depths episodes where they play some game for like six weeks and they'll all play it together and like analyze the design together. And they were doing Noita. And so I was playing Noita along with them. And I was having a lot of fun, but man, am I terrible at that game. <laughs> My favorite thing was just really like the zany effects when you got like really crazy uh, uh, wands or. Um, skipping over areas there's like a million ways to just like skip a whole section and so i got pretty far in the game but not because i'm good at it but because i would spend a lot of time trying to trick things out okay so 102 i wonder if the correct formula is to add 99 let's try that let's try adding 99 and let's take a look at my my article to see if it says to add 99 or add 100, because that there may be an error in the article that we need to fix it, or maybe I already knew this and forgot it. So let's try export, export project, and back to here. Are you still seeing it? Nope. I'll have to kill it. Restart it. Oop, Chrome crashed. Reload Chrome. Oh, it's already here though. For good measure, I'll, I'll hit the reload button again. And this is disconnected. Okay. Custom buffer size is under output encoder settings. Not every encoder supports it though. Hmm. I will definitely, definitely, for sure, check that out after the stream. I need to solve this. Um, bitrate problem. Sergio says, I just play Valorant with some friends on my little to no free time. Yeah, who has free time these days? Nobody. Uh, okay, enter AR. Sweet, okay, look, we are getting the data we need. It's add 99. So let me, let me just kind of do this. I'm gonna touch sort of near the top left Oh, that's interesting too. It's um, the Y coordinate is upside down to the way I would expect it. I would expect the top left corner to have a negative Y of almost negative one, but instead it's a positive Y. 
So we'll have to remember to invert the y-axis. So it's doing a sort of like 3D y-axis. Do you see the zero again here? I don't know if that means like crazy an error happened or like um, I was trying to touch at the bottom right corner when I got that zero. Interesting. So I'm touching like off the, the sort of like near the bottom right corner of the screen and it's pseudo reliably creating those zeros. Yeah, that's interesting. What is that? Hmm. We'll definitely have to have some way to distinguish whatever this event is to at least throw it away so it isn't generating like tons of touch events in the center of the screen. Um, when we get into the, the JavaScript end, we can inspect the input source a little bit and see you know, like what properties are set on it. We saw in this one, where was it? This one. Um, we were checking if the target ray mode is tracked pointer. I'm hoping that there will be some property on the input source that will help us decide which input sources to turn into touch inputs and which not. And hopefully we'll be able to not deal with this weird zero. But guys, look, we got this. We know basically what to do here. So I think we can head back into GDScript for a while and generate some events. So we have to invert the y-axis and we need to turn these into percentages. So we'll say x percent um, would be the x-axis plus two and then to turn that into a percent so it's going to be from zero to two so we do two divided by right am i thinking sane here is that right why does that feel wrong <laughs> let me just do this on a calculator really quick it might just be that my brain is fuzzy I haven't loaded my math unit. My, my internal FPU is down. So okay, if we have one, if one is our value, and we say two divided by one, that does not give us the right thing. The other way around, one divided by two is halfway. Okay. So the axis divided by, yeah. It felt wrong, it was wrong. Y percent, Y axis plus two, or no, it's not plus two, it's plus one. So we want to get from negative one, we want negative one to be zero. Okay, here we go, plus one divided by two. That is the percent calculation. Um, now we need to know the dimensions of the screen. Um, and for the time being, let's just discard those controller zero events because we know they're gonna mess us up. Okay, so now we need to know the dimensions of the screen which is always confusing in Godot because there are several dimensions, right? There is um, the kind of dimension of the the world in, um, not world, but you know what I mean? Like, so Godot has its viewport from, you know, zero to a thousand, but because your screen is actually, I don't know, some other pixel size, that'll be like squashed or stretched to fit the, the screen pixels. Um, and I think what we want is the viewport. I think what we want is the viewport. So get viewport, isn't that called rect, perhaps? Get visible rect? Let's go look at the docs for that. Ricardo asks, what events does dragging and pinching generate? That is a good question. Um, we will test that out. We will test that out. Let's, let's, let's finish this thread that I'm going down, and uh, then we will check that out. Okay, so get visible rect returns the rectangle visible in global screen coordinates. Oh, I do not know if that is the right thing. Um, get size override. There's another get size, size. Okay, size. The width and height of the viewport must be set to a value greater than or equal to two pixels in both dimensions. I think what we want is the like 
internal Godot representation of the size because we're going to need to turn this into touch events for Godot, which are going to be in that size. So I feel like this might be what we want. Let's look at them both. Or actually a visible rect sounds, a rect would be, um, has position too. So this might actually be more like how much of the viewport is actually being shown. Hmm. Let's, let's try size first. So this uh, might actually be better as a vector. Position uh, percentage vector two. And then we will multiply that by the viewport position percentage, and that will theoretically give us the position. See what that gets us. Or actually, uh, vectors print out pretty nice, so we'll just print out the vector position. Does that seem good? Does that look good to you folks? Seems about right to me. Let's give it a try. Let's see what happens. And do our little dance here. Okay. Wiggle the cord. <laughs> Wiggle the cord is part of our official workflow. Uh, reload the page. I'm really bad at these kind of workflow things too, like where it's real repetitive. I think because of the the ADD that I I'm pretty sure I have going on. At some point, I'll I'll end up putting a a like note on the wall, which is like step one, wiggle the cord. <laughs> step two, do this. So I can just look up and be like, what am I supposed to be doing? Um, okay, we're gonna enter AR, and I'm going to tap, and we are getting some stuff here. So screen position. Uh, all right, I'm going to tap in the top left corner, so we should get something close to zero zero. Yeah, I mean, that's relatively close to zero, zero. Um, my phone is a really odd shape, like it has a beveled edge. So I don't know that it's actually possible to touch zero, zero. Ooh, that's real close. I'm like, I'm like touching in like a spot you can't even see anything on. Okay, and then let's try the bottom right edge. That gave us 400 almost and 850 almost. Does that seem realistic? Touch at the middle. Yeah. 425 would be half of 850. 225. I mean this seems it seems good. Let's um let's answer Ricardo's question. What happens if I pinch? That happens. Ooh, whoa. We got a four. Whatever uh this is a pinch. Does it always end on a four? Always ends on a four. I wonder what the heck that is. Okay, and what was the other thing? Dragging. So I'm going to drag with just a single finger. You know, we are only looking at select events. We're not looking at the select start and select end, I think it is, event. Those might be used for the dragging. So we might get a select start a motion event, and then a select end, which would then be followed by just a plain select event uh, to be like the whole touch. So I think that's probably how dragging is represented. The pinching is interesting, though. I'm just pinching down. Let me pinch out. Huh. Oh, what if that's not the pinch? What if that's multi-touch? So one finger is... Uh, 
uh, controller ID three, two fingers would be three and four. So I'm just going to tap with two fingers. Yep, I'm going to tap with three fingers. Haha, -ha, multi touch, three, five, four. So it generates a new controller ID for every finger. How many fingers can it do? Whoa, okay, so I, uh, that, was, that was all five of my fingers. <laughs> let's, try, let's try a sixth finger. Oop, don't turn off on me, phone. It's not, it's not reading anything. I think I, I messed up the connection. Yep, I did. So yeah, it's multi-touch. It's the a new controller ID for each finger. And then I bet, what if um, the, the controller ID 2, which is strangely missing, what if that is the, the view ray? So uh, the different types of like input devices in WebXR, you have the controllers, the pointer tracked. Um, you have a ray that is attached to your head. And you have whatever the heck these are. <laughs> we'll have to find out. We can look in the XR spec. But what if controller ID 2 is the head ray? And uh, then it's generating a 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 for all five fingers. Let me just take a quick look at the... Um, so this would be WebXR immersive web... Not samples. Where can I find the specs? Uh, da, 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 da. Samples proposals. Oh man, I can't remember where this stuff is. I was I was just ta chatting with um with Deep Panther, um about this last week. So let me just look up real quick. I was like linking to stuff. I'm like, I can't find it in this spec. I can't find it in this spec. Okay, let's copy this link. Um, so that was, there was Tracked pointer? Nope, pointer tracked. I'm looking for just the enumeration of all of the um, tracked pointer. Okay, why isn't it in here? Must be a different spec. Tracked pointer. No, there it is. Okay, so the different types of input sources. Gaze, that's the your your head camera pointer. Tracked pointer, which is the, the controller, the touch controller. And screen is what I bet we're getting. Screen indicates that the input source was an interaction with the canvas element associated with an inline session's output context, such as a mouse click or touch event. All right, so we are looking for screen events. That's what we are looking for. And gaze, like I said, will originate at the viewer and follow the direction it's facing. It's commonly referred to as gaze input device in the context of head-mounted displays. Okay, so I think this is how we will how we will differentiate. Uh, once we get into uh, JavaScript and actually building this into the engine, we'll look for uh, input sources with a target ray mode of screen, and we'll convert those into, should we convert them into touch events or should we convert them into click events? That's an interesting question. Um, I think touch events, because there's no idea of multi-touch with a mouse, right? Right? Um, you want input event mouse motion? Is there like an ID of the mouse? Well, I guess it would be device. It would be device. Hmm. Let's do touch events. <laughs> Let's do touch events for now. I'm pretty sure there is. Um, there is a thing, emulate touch from mouse, emulate mouse from touch. So this is the one that is on by default, emulate mouse from touch, will generate touch events, they will create mouse clicks, everything will be good. We won't have to try and understand what multi-touch from a mouse looks like. So where do we go next? Uh, we need to generate the events. So um, I have done this before in a project where I made an Android 
version and I put like an on-screen controller. Um, and so I'm going to look at that project and steal some code from my past self. I'm always plagiarizing my past self. Uh, if that guy only knew. Um, where would I have put this? UI, controls, brr, 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 joystick HGD, perhaps? Send input action. Okay, so this is what we need to do. We need to do something basically like this. I'm just going to copy it and put it in here. Send input action. We'll change this to send, we'll say um, touch event. Uh, let's take a look at what the touch events look like in go so input event. Um, Event screen touch. Okay, so index, is this referring to which finger? Yep, haha, <laughs> okay. So we'll have to um, come up with some way to convert the controller ID to the, uh, the finger. I don't know if we can rely on the behavior that we saw where we would basically just subtract three from it. Um, I don't know if that's just a Chrome thing. Uh, I don't really have a way to test uh, WebXR AR in a different browser. I don't know. If Firefox even supports that, to be honest. Um, but we'll see. We'll see. We'll try it at first and, and see what happens when it, when it gets out into the wild. Um, so we want to generate screen touch events. So we send screen touch event. We'll create an input event screen touch. And how will we do this? We are sending um, an index, that will be the finger. Um, we are sending a position, which is a vector two. Let's go back and look at these, this again. So position, oh, okay. Um, it's always gonna be pressed though. Right? What do we do with pressed? Are we going to have to like release the touch events? Are we going to have to track which ones are are pressed and then release them? Hmm. Well, let's just pass in a bool for it for now. We'll figure out how to set that later. So we want to do pressed event index equals index event what was the other thing position event position equals position <laughs> Sergio says I don't think uh, 850 is close to regular smartphone resolution so uh, I know this is from way a long time ago uh, but we're not looking for the screen position we're looking for the position in the scene in Godot which will be different than the actual screen resolution um, because it will be, you know, stretched or expanded or whatever. We, we need that kind of like virtual position, not the real screen position. So it still could be wrong. <laughs> but uh, the reason that it might not look like a normal smartphone resolution is, is, is that. Okay, so we'll do send screen touch event. We're going to do controller ID minus three position. And we're just going to say press true. I don't know. Um, yeah, I'll, we'll have to look at like how touch events are handled normally, and if it's doing like a a touched pressed, and then immediately after a touch, you know, not pressed in the same spot. I don't do a lot of um, a lot of uh, smartphone games, so off the top of my head, I, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, and let's export it. Let's see what this does. This may press the button. Get ready, folks. This may actually press the button. All right. Step one, jiggle the cord. <laughs> Step two, press inspect. Step three, refresh the browser. Hmm. 
Hmm, not coming through here. What is going on? Okay, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna completely disconnect the cord. Completely reconnect the cord. Refresh? Can I refresh this page? Oh, oh, oh. I have jiggled. Hmm. I'm going to try closing this window and opening it again. Or inspect devices. What did I, what did I type wrong? Impact. Inspect. I have jiggled, pending authentication. You always say that, though. You literally never ask me for permission. I mean, maybe you ask me once. But you always say, please accept debugging. But it, it, there is no debugging. Hmm. What? What? I mean, I have the little thing that says, I don't know. I'm just going to try it, guys. I'm just going to try it, um, and I'll see if it works. The screen is black. That can't be good. Okay, I'm going to try refreshing the page again. Reloading. If it works, I'll do this screen sharing thing so you guys can actually see on the phone and then we can celebrate. So enter AR. All right, I have gone to AR, but it's frozen and crashed. <laughs> frozen and crashed. Let's try this again. Ooh, and it appeared here for a second. Come back. I have a feeling I'm, there might be some 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 bug that's causing it to crash. Ooh, good, and we're actually seeing this again. Okay. Cool. Enter AR. Why is this happening constantly? What are we doing that's making that take so long? Okay, so it's in AR. It seems to be working. I'm going to tap. We get that. Let me tap the button. No good. <laughs> hmm. So it's not making the button work. I have an idea though. What if uh what if it's looking for pressed false in the sense that it's looking to see that you released? Um Let me try just setting this to false and see what happens. Anybody over here have any ideas? Oh, Sergio's doing the drum roll. The drum roll is very anticlimactic so far. <laughs> Let's see. Let's see. Or, hey, hey, what if we just do, um, what if we just do true false? It was pressed and then it wasn't pressed. On off. Let's try that. Um, export, export project. Then wiggle the cord. <laughs> And where is it? Sorry, sir. XR. Refresh the page. Hey. 
Enter AR. All right, I'm gonna press the button. <laughs> it worked, it worked. The button was pressed. It says pressed. All right, I'm gonna keep my promise here. We're loading this up. We're loading this up in uh, the screen share thing. And then we're gonna celebrate. <laughs> it looks it looks totally unimpressive, by the way, because like the rendering issue makes it so I can't even really see the button. I don't even get to see it go in and out or anything. <laughs> But it is good enough for me. It's good enough for me to celebrate. You know, I, I'll, we'll make it better. But it, as far as declaring some sort of partial victory here. Uh, could not get device connection. All right. All right. Wake up the phone. Wiggle the cord. <laughs> There we go. Um, I have to bring it over to, uh, to to this screen. It's on my other monitor right now. And you will see. Are you ready? Enter AR. Oop, should probably not cover it with my... Um, there we go. The button is up there. I'm going to press it. It's going to get pressed. And it says pressed. <laughs> Of course, like doing that alert box takes it out of AR, <laughs> but it works. We have the right idea here. This is this is what we need to do. We'll have to figure out um, exactly how to handle um, the the drag events, uh, like Ricardo brought up. But we know roughly how to do it. Now let's let's I guess figure out where in C++ we need to inject this code because we need somewhere where we know well, what the input source looks like. Um, or we need to pass more data about the input source uh, up to C++ land and then do it in C++ um, from JavaScript land. We have this nice uh, uh, Matryoshka doll situation with um, JavaScript on the bottom C++ uh, in the middle, and uh, GD script on the top. Oh, yeah, Sergio's celebrating, getting those party horns out. <laughs> We're almost there, Sergio. Maybe in another month, <laughs> you'll be able to actually make your AR game. This is just how development goes, though. I mean, this is just software development in a microcosm. You know, you, you, you slowly figure things out. Uh, for me... That's a mix of experimenting and talking with people who might know the answer. Uh, the WebXR community is great, guys. Um, the, there's a WebXR Discord. If you do anything with WebXR, you should totally join there. The people are super helpful. There's folks, knowledgeable folks from basically every game engine community. Uh, I would not have figured this out without the help of DPanther. So join that Discord. Awesome folks. Uh, OK, so C++. JavaScript. Okay, so at sample controllers, we do know the target ray mode, but I don't think this is the place to do it. Um, this is just dropping the controllers into this um, object to map to it from other indexes. Get controller ID. Do we have a method that tells us more information about the input sources? Let's look at uh, Godot WebXRH. So this is where we're declaring all of the uh, C linkage methods that uh, we then implement in JavaScript. And what would be great here is if we could get info about the controller, like just the the um, the target ray, what is that called? Um, where did I have that open? The target ray mode. And passing strings from JavaScript to C++ is a pain. And I'd rather not do it, because that brings into like memory allocation and all these kind of stuff. So we should make it a num uh, that gives the different uh, types. This could make things a little bit difficult for us in the future if uh, WebXR, uh, the immersive web group, decides to add a new target ray mode. Uh, we'll have to actually you know, update that 
that in num, but we aren't sharing this with users on the GDScript side at all. This is just for our own internal use. So I'm thinking, I'm thinking that's what we should do. Um, we will declare an enum here. Should we do it here? This file is only included in like one place. Um, I'm actually leaning to maybe not declaring it here. Although we declare all these type defs here. Yeah, let's declare it here. In num, uh, gdo, webxr, um, target ray mode, and I forget how enums work in C++. Is this going to put the values at the global scope? Or are we going to have to type like gdo webxr target ray mode dot something? Um, Again, okay, this, this, this header is only included in one place. I don't need to overthink this. So this would be like um, target ray mode. Um, okay, yeah, I guess that determines whether I put that in front or not. So we'll say gaze. You don't need to put the zero. We'll say gaze, tracked, pointer, and screen. I just don't know. If we type gaze, does that actually evaluate to something? Or do we have to type so WebXR target ray mode gaze like that? Yeah, okay. Int i equals. I'm trying to use uh, VS Code's like C++ parsing to decide what is valid uh, C++ or not, which isn't perfect. I don't like it. I don't like it. That appears to be added uh, as a thing. Okay, so we're gonna do target ray mode gaze typo target ray mode track pointer target ray mode screen and what we need is Godot WebXR get controller target ray mode. And it's going to return an int, not an int pointer. And now we got to go define this over in JavaScript. Uh, okay, we put that after get controller axes. So we will put it after that in the JavaScript code as well, because that's how I tend to like to organize my things. Um, get controller axes. So right here. Ah! VS Code's Vimness always annoying me. Get controller axes. All right, we'll copy this beginning stuff. Oh, we need some value to return that is um, the no value, like an unknown value. So that'll change our num a little bit. Um, we will no longer start the num with gaze because we need to have zero be like the, the non-value value. So get controller um, tracked, what was it called? Target ray mode. Target ray mode. Um, so we don't need a gamepad necessarily. Let's jump back up to the header file. Where's the header file? Where'd you go? Here it is. Target ray mode unknown. And we'll set that explicitly to zero. Not ah, I never mind. You guys get to see me be neurotic about all of these things. A num class may be nice. Um is that a thing that I can just do? Like I know if I define a class in an enum. 
you may have just taught me a new C++ trick that I did not know. So it looks like target ray mode is no longer valid. But Godot WebXR tracked ray mode. Of course, I cannot trust VS codes. Or no, not dot. Wrong language. What are you saying here? Value cannot be used to initialize. Oh, because we have to... No, if, if I have to... Um, if I have to treat it as not an integer, that's going to cause problems. I think, I think I'm just going to use a normal enum and deal with that. That is cool, though. I didn't know a num class was a thing. Um, I'm a little bit curious about that. num classes and their advantages over a num. When was this added to C++? That is interesting. Um, Can't, oh, here we go. C11. Perhaps. Perhaps. <laughs> In nums instructs. Num class. Well, anyway, that's cool. Thanks, thanks for sharing that, Ricardo. I will, uh, I will add that to my toolbox of. Um... Oh, here we go. This answers the question. A num class or a num struct sends C11. Cool. From the CPP reference, which is a great website, by the way. C++ stuff. Okay, so let's carry on here. Uh, we need to actually implement this. Um, target ray mode. We'll do like a big switch statement. Uh, we'll say controller um, which, what exactly, what type is the controller exactly? Is that already an input source? I mean, this, this might, this might work, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, let me just look at sample controllers. It is the actual input source, and the input source has a target mode on it. Okay. Oh, we're already here. Okay. And we have case gaze. We will return one because we don't have access to the enum here because uh, this is JavaScript. Tracked pointer. Return two. Case screen. We return three. And at the end, we return zero. I think that should be enough. I think that should be enough. All of this looks more or less correct. Return an integer, take an integer. So now we should be able to call this method. I think um, the same place that we are uh, doing everything else with input in C++ land is where we should do this. So get uh, controller stuff update controller here we go this is the one. Oh, yep it's starting down here okay so we do all of the normal things and we'll add a new thing at the end where we will do um int target ray mode equals godot webxr get controller target ray mode p controller id and we need to say if target ray mode equals 
I guess we can just do this thing that I hate. Type out the, the name. No, I'm going to do it the way that I like. I'm going to do it the way I like. So that's Godot, WebXR, target, ray, mode, target, ray, mode, um, screen. And here is where we will put basically everything we just did in GDScript, but in, um, no, we can't do this here, can we? No, we need the select event. We need it to be on the select event. Update tracker isn't sufficient. Um, so we'll have to save this code for the right place. This is the wrong place. So on input event, emits these signals. I'm curious this input source. We're always adding one to it? Why is that? Couldn't I have left myself a comment to explain it? <laughs> Past David, what are you doing to me? Okay, so here's where we want to do it. If the signal is a particular signal, so uh, I hate C strings. So it just like hurts me how slow they are to compare to things, and I just like know how slow they are. And I'm trying to imagine in my brain: is there an efficient way to do this this string comparison? But there there just might not be. Um, well, an integer comparison is quick, so we'll start with that. We'll say, um, uh, we'll grab our target ray mode code that we wrote in the wrong place, and we will copy it um, up to this on input event. And so we'll do this integer comparison first, and then we will look at the signal name. So we'll say if string comp um, p signal name select equals zero, then here we'll do what we did in JavaScript. So Um, are there things we want to do for every single event? Probably. Ah, I just hate these C strings. I'm trying to think how we could have some code that would be shared with select end and select start. But the fact is, all input events come here. And I don't think we ever want to do this for squeeze events. Um, or any of the other input events. Or are those all of them? Select all the selects, all the squeezes. Let me go look at this code. So on input, uh, uh, on input event. So where are we using this? We're using it Uh, it gets crammed into one on input event. So we're using it for, okay, the selects and the squeezes. I wonder if it's worth like breaking the, this up into two callbacks so that we have some stuff that will always happen on select and some stuff that will always happen on squeeze. Or maybe the squeeze events do actually do something and we should have them share an event uh, call back because in the future we might want to do it for those. And certainly if an event comes through with type where the target ray mode is screen, then we want to do something with it. So I'm just going to, I'm just, even though this might be a little bit inefficient, I'm just going to leave it this way. Um, and what we'll do is we'll 
we'll capture, we'll always capture the position. We'll always calculate an index. Okay, int index, which we don't need to do here necessarily. Position requires some calculating. So vector two position. Um, let's go look at our GD script code to figure out how we're going to calculate this. So we, we, we get the axes and we do this and this. Yeah, let's do it exactly the same way. Let's do it exactly the same way. Um, so we will have int x axis um, equals What is the way to get this from C++? Do we have a better way to get it? I think we do. Um, let's go look at uh, get controller, uh, get controller axes. Yeah, you know, I've been spending a lot of time thinking about the way that I implemented these methods. So we have all of these like methods that call into JavaScript and get things. And every single time we are allocating memory and then freeing it. And I have no idea why I did that at the time. Um, maybe it was just because like I was thinking in a non C++ -y way. But what we really should have done is allocated some memory and passed it in as a reference. And then had the JavaScript methods populate that memory so we could allocate it once and just use it over and over again. Whereas here we're like allocating this little tiny array and freeing this little tiny array. Um, in retrospect, that was a really weird thing to do, but uh, that's that's for the future. <laughs> we're not going to do that right now. So yeah, this is this is the better way. Ah, but I wanted to stay there. Get controller axes. Let's copy this code. I'm actually going to copy all of this because I want to I want to have this the way this floating uh, this float pointer math is done for reference okay so axes uh, we'll get that then we are going to do int x axis equals um, or it's not an int it's a float float X axis equals how did we do that in GD script again? Uh, the joy axis and okay, and we just invert the 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 y. Okay, so we're just getting the axis. So axis zero or first of all, we need to say if axes. So if not axes then we just fail there's nothing to do here or no let's let's do a positive check those read nicer <laughs> if axes then we start doing our thing get the x-axis uh, but not this way we have to do this this crazy pointer math Axes plus i plus one. What is this pointer math doing? Okay, so the i is. Oh, and we have um. We we have the length. Okay, so the number of axes has to be greater than two, uh, and that's stashed as the the first. Uh, integer-sized piece of memory in this uh, this axes that we got back from JavaScript. So we say if axes zero is greater than uh, greater than or equal to two, because we need at least two axes, then we grab these values. Um, which actually, yeah, we'll have to declare them up here. X axis float Y axis. And then we'll assign them if they exist. 
using this zany zany pointer math, which I guess we're doing axes plus the the plus two, right? Plus no, plus one. Yeah, plus one, because <laughs> zero is the count, so plus one, and this is, we're converting it into a float pointer to do the math, and then we are dereferencing it. There's got to be like an easier to read way to do this than I did with this pointer math, but it's fine, it's fine, it just takes a minute to, to understand it. Okay, so, and then once we do that, we need to free uh, axes. Don't want to hang on to that memory forever. And then we carry on. Uh, our GD script does the percentage first, which I think is a nice way to do it. The code reads real good that way. So we'll say vector position percentage. Um, oh, we don't need to do an equals. We can do this like this. Uh, and what did we do? It was plus one divided by two, plus one divided by two. So x axis plus one divided by two. And y, uh, y axis plus one divided by two. And vector to position. Uh, how do we get the viewport? Is that it like VSG? Maybe? Hmm, okay. Figure out how to get the viewport from C. Um, what's in Visual Server Globals? That gives us not the viewport. Okay, so maybe it's actually on the viewport class. Viewport. Get singleton. Single. No, how do we get the viewport? Get viewport. Nope. Okay. Where do I look for the viewport? Is it on the main loop? So that would be scene tree. Viewport. Front class viewport. Get root. Is this the viewport that I'm looking for? Scene tree get root. Hmm. I wish the um, the C plus the C plus plus code was documented better. Whenever I need documentation for the C plus plus code, I look at the GD script documentation because it is always much better. Well, let's look in scene tree CPP, see how it treats this root. I'm just going to guess that this is the the um, the viewport, and then I forget how we get the scene tree. It's like get main loop, something like that. Um, uh, uh, main loop, is that a singleton? No. Let's look in main CPP. Um, main loop. Where does main loop get assigned to? How can we get it? How can we get you main loop after the fact? Anyone in, in, in chat know? Um, 
OS, get singleton, set main loop. So perhaps get main loop from the OS singleton. Let's try that. Um, this might not be the best way to get it, uh, but let's try it. OS, get singleton. Get main loop, is that even a method? Where's my autocomplete? Main loop, OS server, get main loop. Is this the way in? Is this how we should be doing this? Hmm. So how do we ensure that it is a scene tree? Um, I guess we would do a uh, scene tree, scene tree equals object cast to scene tree this. And then we would have to do if scene tree. We may have to do this earlier because <laughs> uh, we don't want to do this at all if we don't have a if we don't have a scene tree as the main loop. Um, so and this is where we do get uh, viewport on right scene tree or get root get root. for our viewport. So how should this code look? We only run it if we have a target ray mode. We only do anything if we have enough axes to determine this position. Um, but we also need to have a scene tree, which I guess we can do way at the top. So if not scene tree, then return. I don't like doing these return statements in like the middle of a method that isn't fully based around um, doing this one particular thing. So maybe all this code should be like in a different method. Um, But I don't know. Let's leave it like this for now. We can make it cleaner later. We'll make it cleaner before we make the PR because we, we want our code to look good when we show it to the uh, to the other uh, Godot developers. Okay, so vector two position equals um, get the viewport here. Uh, viewport get size. Why are you not auto-completing for me, VS Code? Visual script component. What? Did I do the wrong kind of viewport? Hmm. Okay. Let's let's go look at the let's go look at the viewport code for a second, just to make sure I'm doing the right thing. We'll look at the binding stuff. Um, Find methods uh, and whatever it, uh, is doing size, whatever is defining the size property is what we are going to call get size. Okay, all right. Get size times position. Uh, percentage, and then we are going to send the event. Um, and I guess we do want to have like a, a method like we made in GDScript to encapsulate that. <laughs> Sergio, yeah, make it work, then make it pretty. I concur. Uh, da, da, da. So what am I doing? What was I doing before I got distracted by <laughs> Sergio's comment? Okay, um, we are gonna need some helper methods. So maybe I should just make a method for this straight out of the straight out of the gate. 
So I guess it would be a static uh, void. Um, we'll call it. What, what, what should we call it? Not emwebxr. Um, not Godot WebXR, because we're already using that for, for a thing. Uh, XR. Okay, I'm declaring it as static, which in C++ linkage means the linker will not export it, correct? So I can name it whatever I want and not worry about it, right? Are other people doing that in the Godot code base? I mean, static functions can do anything, but let's ah, let's search the Godot code base for things being called static. Yeah. Okay. Okay, <laughs> well, that's bullet. Let's, let's go back to the stuff before that. Uh, I think I got the impression, though, that, that other people in the, in the Godot code base were doing this. So, like, over here in the collision solver sat, which I have spent a little bit of time in <laughs> when looking at how Godot does its physics. There are, for example, generate contacts, and they just named it any old way. They just named it any old way. They didn't put physics in front of it. They didn't put collision solver sat in front of it. They just named it. So that's what we're going to do. Okay, static void. Uh, we're going to say um, generate touch from a, a screen input. And what we will pass in is a the signal name, the signal name and the input source. So the same, the same parameters here. So need a, uh, a, a char pointer. Uh, Got to use the Godot style here. Char, char pointer p signal name and um, int p controller id. And we're going to take all of this code, drop it in there. And this is just going to call generate touch from screen input p signal name p controller. Why is autocomplete not working for me? This is or p input source p input source. Maybe I should call this input source too. It's not really a controller. And it's consistent. Okay, so. Oh, and now we have a string name. Oh, and that makes comparisons faster too. I can stop agonizing over. Okay, sweet. This is going to take signal name. And it's going to be a string name, which compares as fast as an integer. And then I can stop worrying about that forever. Um, I think we want to pass a, a const reference, though, don't we? I'm not sure. I may need to look at what other people are doing. Let me grep for const string name ampersand maybe nobody is doing that maybe people are passing just string name as is let's grab just for string name see what we get returns are doing just string name oh and here we go Here's a argument just doing string name. Okay, so we aren't going to do const. We are going to do just straight up string name. 
Okay. Cool. And then we don't need to do this junk. Just kill that. Um, which I think would just look like if uh, p signal name equals select. And I know there's a way to like in Godot 4 cache these literal strings into string names, but I, I, I don't know if there's a way to do that in Godot 3. Um, so we'll just leave that that way. All right. Um, where are we now? So then we need this other static method to actually generate the touch events or to send the touch event. So that will be taken more or less from our GD script. I'm just going to copy the GD script and then modify it. Might be a little weird, but. Send screen touch event uh, int p index. Uh, we'll do vector two, which I think people do do const reference for. Vector two p position and bool p pressed. And we'll do um, input event screen touch event uh, which I don't know your constructor in C++ or since it's a bound thing it might just be the same yeah okay cool 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 um, ah. event equals mem new input do I have to make it on the heap? When we do this elsewhere in the code, do we allocate them on the heap or do we do them on the stack? So um, parse input event. I know we're doing it. We're doing it later somewhere. I thought we were. I thought we were doing it in um, update tracker. Oh, we're doing it indirectly through these like helper methods. Um, this comes down to axis event, which does this. Oh, okay, it does a ref. It is essentially on the heap. Um, I've never done this this way with refs. Instance? That's cool. Um, yeah, I like that. That's a really nice shorthand. I was not aware that that was a thing. Okay, so we'll do it like this. We'll do it like this. Back up to the top. How are we doing on time? Ah, we're running out of time. Let's see if we can get C++ doing what we're doing in GDScript. And we will call this a successful stream insofar as like we basically figured out what needs to be done. Um, we still have to uh, fill in a whole bunch of stuff for like drag and uh, uh, some other things. But this is probably, I don't know, two more hours after this of work to get it done. Um, this is awesome. And this code should look super similar to the GD script, although I think we have to actually call methods, right? Set index, index, I think. Let's go look at this. Yep. Yeah, because again, this is a bound, a bound class, so we don't get direct access. Um, set position. Uh, wait, hang on. P index. Key position event set pressed p pressed and I forget how we get access to the input daily. Uh, let's get back to update tracker. Here we go. This. Um, 
go back up to the top. I actually don't know that we need to cast it to input default. Um, we might be able to do this with just straight up input. Let's, let's go look. Does this have parse input event? It does. So we don't need to cast it. We can make this code a little bit simpler. In fact, we can just do input get a singleton parse input event event. Bam. Okay. So that is our C++ version of send touch screen event. And if the signal is select, then we do send. What is with autocomplete? You should be able to seriously autocomplete this VS code. Hmm. Um, let's make a little temporary variable for the index, uh, which would be Or hang on, we're using p controller ID. This is p input source. Send screen touch event index. All right, I'm going to do input source minus three. I hope that that works everywhere. <laughs> oh, I realized we forgot to do something. We forgot to invert the y axis. Um, that is some ugly looking code right there. I might do this on a separate line just to make it easy to, to uh, understand what's happening for future me. Uh, invert u y axis equals axis negative y axis. And here we go. Uh, index position true index position false oh <laughs> Sergio said remember to invert the y-axis not sure if you did already I don't know if you said that before or after it occurred to me uh, but we are thinking the same thing we are thinking the same thing at the same time great minds think alike is what my my uh, my pa always used to say to me when I was growing up Whenever two people would think the same thing, great minds think alike. The, the implication being that uh, we're both great. It's just a way to <laughs> for everyone to compliment themselves. All right, why does like the syntax highlighting look really weird here too? Like, what is up with VS Code? Like, shouldn't scene tree be highlighted green and like I don't know what's going on. Ah, what did I do? What was that about? Okay. Um, this code is more or less correct. More or less. Let's uh, go to our project here, and let's comment out all of this. Um, for now, let's compile. We have so little time, we'll probably just have time for like a single compile. Let's compile, see how far we get. Probably fix a compiler error or two. Yep, what did I screw up? Probably the thing that's making all of the, uh, yep, I forgot some semicolons. Probably the thing that's been making autocomplete not work and the syntax highlighting be wrong and all of that. Okay, so I forgot some semicolons. Um, what else? Uh, undeclared identifier that is in this first part. Uh, yep, p controller ID. This is p input source. VS Code, you're supposed to tell me about these things in advance. I don't know why you're not. Generate touch from screen input. Undeclared. So I typoed generate. No, it doesn't look like I typoed. Oh, and I typed axes instead of axis at some point. All right, compiler, what else did I typo?
use of undeclared identifier. Is this just like an order thing? C++, you are so archaic. Okay, we'll just put these above. <laughs> we'll just put these above that method instead of below. Okay, a little bit further here. Oh, I have to invert the order of these methods too. I don't know very much about the C++ module thing. It was added in some later version of C++. Um, does that fix the order thing? Like if you use C++ modules, can you just declare your methods in any order? Um, or not methods, functions, because these are functions. That would be really sweet. I don't think we're allowed to use modules in um, Godot. Uh, I don't think that follows with the style guide of, uh, I guess it's more than style, but you know the, the guidance on what C++ features you're allowed to use. But um, something that makes header files less annoying would be fabulous. All right. We are building. We are linking. It's going to happen. And then I think I think what we the only thing we need to do beyond just like clean up and stuff, assuming this works, is also handling select start and select end and turning those into um turning those into a uh, uh, drag start and drag stop events? Or do we have to get fancier than that maybe? We might have to like actually watch for some dragging to occur. Um, I'm not sure. Let's look at, actually, let's, while we're waiting for this to link, which is going to take forever, uh, not forever, you know, a couple of minutes, let's look at how Deep Panther handles this. So select... No need to call touch move here. Select start. Creates a touch start event and touch end event. And then I guess probably Unity does some sort of conversion from touch start and touch end into a drag event for its internals. Deep Panther is doing this at a totally different layer, by the way. Um, rather than creating events and sending them to whatever Unity's event processing thing, at least as far as I understand this, because like I don't know Unity at all, but uh, it, it appears like he's doing it at the JavaScript layer. So rather than generating touch events for Unity, he's generating JavaScript touch events and letting Unity catch those and do its own processing to them, I think. I think that's what's happening. Um, where we're doing it at a different layer. We're not generating like JavaScript touch events. We're generating only Godot touch events, which I feel like is the better way to do it, um, given how how nice it is to work with Godot's event system. So, input event screen. What is it? Screen drag. So we have screen touch and we have screen drag. Input event type for screen drag events. So how do these events work? Do we have a start and stop, or do we? Yeah, we'll have. I mean, that's the next big thing to figure out here is is how to relate this to drag events. Not that that's even that important. Ooh, it finished. Okay, let's do this. Let's do this. How much time? Oh, we're five minutes over. Let's get this done. Let's make this happen. Let's end this stream on a. Uh, essentially total victory which is always fun we we rarely ever get them <laughs> okay turn on the phone i'm going to remove and actually put the cable back in rather than just jiggling it okay we will do toy racer xr refresh the page i exported right i didn't forget to export i guess we'll find out if we still see that junk printing out on the console, I forgot to hit export.
Okay, enter AR. I am in AR. We're still getting some stuff printed. I may have not commented out everything. Yeah, I didn't comment I didn't comment out this one, but I commented out this one, so we're not seeing the position stuff. Okay. I'm gonna press the button. Oh it works! It works! Okay. Woof. Good work team. <laughs> we we got there. Let me uh make sure I have this in like a branch. Uh and so what would this would be? This would be like WebXR. Um AR touch events. We'll call it that. And let's look at our code, get status. Uh, those look like the right files to change. Let's look at the diff a little bit. Oh, this is a bad place to look at the diff because you guys can't see over my head. So let me move it up here. Um, we added a num. We had this extra target ray mode thing. We had these static functions. Uh, here's a random new line that shouldn't have been added. Um, where is that? That's an update tracker. I'll go pull that out. Update tracker. There it is. All right. I'm going to commit this to my branch. And uh, off stream, I'll do the, the drag stuff, I think. Um, if I find the time, if for some reason I don't find the time, maybe we'll do another stream on it. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, that's all we got. We got figuring out the drag events and, uh, making the, the PR to the Godot engine. Style fix here. Oh, yep. Apply. Do it. Okay. I can now stage and commit again. Cool. What? No verify? Is it no verify or skip verify? Okay, there we go. Um, this will be like first pass at converting select events to Godot touch events. And I'm going to push it into my fork. And the code is 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 why 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 is Git, github going so slow here well it's pushing you believe me right <laughs> uh, thanks everyone for coming to the stream uh i'm sorry again for the bitrate issues i will swap this video for a recording that will look better uh but thanks everyone for coming for hanging out uh for for giving advice and encouragement and all of that <sighs> awesome stream. Hope you guys have a great rest of your week, weekend. I'll talk to you on Discord or next week. Bye-bye.